Good morning, EBC. This is the day that the Lord has made, and our declaration is we will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Anybody grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Well, clap your hands, all ye people. While you're clapping, somebody open your mouth and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Come on, stand on your feet all over the room. Come on, put those hands together like this.
him. We come to lift him. We come to lift him. When we lift him, he'll begin to lift our burdens. When we lift him, he'll begin to lift our hearts. When we lift him, he'll begin to change our situations. Somebody lift up the name of our God. We magnify you in this place. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless your name, God. Lift your hands all over the sanctuary as a sign of surrender unto our Father. Father, we lift our hands in the sanctuary. We lift up holy hands. We lift our hearts unto you. And we declare that you are the one that helps us. You are the one that's there when we need anything. You are the one that's always right there with us. So we lift up our hands. There's a lifting of the hands. Yeah. And there's a lifting of the heart, oh, yeah. And there's a lifting of the eyes beyond the hills where our help comes from. Can we lift that up together all over the room? Say, there's a lifting, yeah. Come on, lift your hands in the sanctuary. See, there's a lifting. Come on, that's it. Lift your voices all over the room. There's a lifting. Beyond the hills. Where our hell comes How many believe your help comes from the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's prayer time, church. Understand, prayer is not just something that we do. Prayer is how we communicate directly to God. And we no longer need a mediator. Because of Christ and what he did, we have a direct pathway to God. So even now, if you would, join hands with your neighbor. Everyone touching someone as a sign of solidarity, that we're touching in the green, that we're going to stand in faith that whatever our neighbor stands in need of, that God will do. We're also going to pray a twofold prayer as we have a delegation getting ready to go on mission with God. We're going to also pray and cover them as well. Let us pray. Oh, we bless you, God. We give you all the praise and the glory. We ask you to bless these, your servants. Feel their hearts for those that you're commissioning with the power of your Holy Spirit. We send them forth as messengers of salvation and peace in your name. Mark with the sign of the cross. Cover them. Touch. Bless everything their hands touch. Father, everything their feet walk upon. We pray for the lives that they shall encounter. Father, let seeds be planted that someone else may water, but God, you alone will bring increase. We pray that their lives are changed. We pray that someone come to know you through your service. So, Father, we pray for their safety. We pray for safe travel. Father, cover them. Give them the peace in knowing that they are in the palm of your hands. So, Father, commit our Cape Town, South Africa team to you, praying that you will open hearts around them and that they will be confident in your word. We also pray that we will have the servant heart of Jesus Christ and be actively engaged in a light group and in the love and action outreach. We remain in perfect peace because we trust you to provide every aspect of our building renovation. Father, we pray for the hand we hold. Whatever they stand in need of, Lord, meet them at their point of need. So Father, we're gonna squeeze their hands as a sign that if peace is needed, Father, we're giving them peace. If faith is needed, Father, strengthen their faith. If joy is needed, Father, restore unto them the joy of their salvation. And Father, we'll be ever so mindful to give you all the praise, give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And this is your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say amen. Amen.
EBC family, we are excited that with each passing week, we are able to see continuous progress and development in the renovation of our Atlanta campus sanctuary. We are excited to announce that this past week, construction of the audiovisual booth within the sanctuary has been completed and we have begun to install the theater seating within the sanctuary. It is our desire to complete this noble work of beautifying the Lord's house debt free but we need the hands of all our members and partners on deck. If you have yet to be a partner with us by way of a pledge, then we encourage you to partner with us today as well. It is our desire to have 100% participation from our membership as we have collectively embarked upon this journey of renovation together. Let's continue to follow the spirit of the Lord as he leads us by his grace. Thank you for your continued support. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we assuredly go from dream to destiny. Ready, set, serve. Are you looking for a way to be a tangible expression of the love of Christ in the earth? Let us help you put love in action. Come, use your gifts and talents to bring a smile to the face of a child, to bring joy to the elderly to care for the homeless, and much more on Saturday, August 31st. Let us help you make a difference in the world by making a difference in the community. Go to www.elizabethbaptist.org now for more information and prepare to put your love in action. Life groups are small groups of 10 to 15 people who meet weekly to spend time diving into God's Word while cultivating relationships. And at EBC, we want you to join us in this enriching experience. Sign up is as easy as click, click, click. Visit elizabethbaptist.org. Click connect. Click life groups. Locate the life group you'd like to join. Search by EBC location, day, or type of life group you'd like to be a part of. Then click current registration to register for your chosen life group. What are you waiting for? Go ahead, EBC. Click, 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 and join a life group today. All right, let's try this again. Good morning, EBC. What if I told you that it's time for me to go out and put my love in action, says Jesus? Will you be my hands and my feet? What if I told you I needed more disciples, says Jesus? Would you be one or would you make one? Love in action is just around the corner. And in my experience with love and action, it's been a vital component for me in my relationship with, with Christ and growing in, in the word with him and also in developing my relationships with those within my life group. Um, about a week or so ago, I had a young lady in my office. I was conducting an interview with her. And at the end of the interview, she asked me a question. I gave her an opportunity to ask a question. And she asked me, she said, how is it as a business owner that you feel so comfortable with displaying your love and your faith for Christ? I see these scriptures on the wall, and how is it that you feel so comfortable doing that? And I thought that was a strange question. I'd never received that question before. So after I answered it and I went home and thought about it, I really thank God for blessing me with um, Elizabeth Baptist Church and our church family and growing me and strengthening me. Um, in, in Christ through the relationships that I have through love and action and also through our life groups. So just wanted to come and bring you a word today to tell you that um, it's still um, plenty of time to sign up for a life group. It's also um, time left for you to connect with love and action and there's 18 different opportunities available to connect and serve. Um, our next Love in Action will be held on Saturday, August the 31st. And if you would like to join and participate in either a life group or Love in Action, you can do so by um, clicking, um, going to our church's website, going to the mobile app, and clicking to connect to sign up and register. Um, so I encourage you to build in your relationships, build your, strengthen your faith in Christ, build your relationships with those in ministry, and come out and serve with us. We have an awesome time. I serve with the Helps Ministry, um, and I'm looking forward to serving yet again on Saturday, August the 31st. I'll see you there.
Good morning. Need you to do me a favor. If you got a, your purse or a bag or something in the seat, can you kind of move it forward so we can kind of squeeze in? We got more people that want to come in and worship. Amen. 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 Listen, if you're visiting us for the first time, why don't you kind of wave your hand? Today's your first time. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Dr. Craig Oliver Sr. and Lady Oliver and the entire Elizabeth Baptist Church family, I want to extend a heartfelt welcome and greeting unto you. At our church, we are leveraging technology. So what we would like you to do is go ahead and pull out your smartphone. And we want you to text the word guest, it's on the screen, to 404-800-1593. Text the word guest. What's going to happen, you're going to get a direct message from our pastor's heart directly to yours. Acknowledging your presence here today, you're also going to get a link to a sermon of one of his that he's preached that is going to bless your life. So once again, we want to welcome you here today. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet, everyone. In the same spirit of worship we just had, I want you to take the time and greet at least two or three of your neighbors that you do not know. the day the Lord has made, and we're excited about the opportunity to rejoice and be glad in it. And we truly thank God to stand for this opportunity to stand before you. Uh, just one housekeeping uh, item before we go into our offertory period. Uh, we would ask men, if you are in, uh, in a position where you're holding a seat, we, of course, as men of Elizabeth, we defer to the women of Elizabeth in terms of seating. So if at all possible, if we could ask our men who, if there are space available, if you could move to the bleachers and so that we can get our women seated uh, appropriately, we certainly will thank you for that. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Well, as mentioned, this is the portion of the service where we are excited because we all have the opportunity to worship God in our giving. Can we thank God for the privilege that is ours to give and to sow? And so we joyfully sow our tithes and our offerings. And even as we saw the update to the renovation where we're, we're seeing movement, we truly thank God for all of our Dream to Destiny partners. And so if you're making payments on your pledge today or you're just giving your tithes and offerings, you can do so by way of our traditional envelope system, wherein you simply complete the envelope legibly so that we are able to allocate your funds as you have designated them. Additionally, you're able to, of course, give by way of text giving. If you simply text the word EBC in your city, that's one word, EBC in your city, to the number 73256, that's 73256, you can facilitate your giving that way. You may also give by way of the website, www.elizabethbaptist.org, or you may give by way of the EBC app. You, may be able, you should be able to facilitate your giving in that manner as well. And so, as I mentioned, we not only give with a sense of joy and cheerfulness, but we also give with a sense of expectation. And it is with that expectation that I'm going to ask that you will stand with me as we recite our offertory declaration. For we know that God is faithful to his word, and so we give with a sense of expectation that he will honor his word. So at the count of three, if you will read with me, one, two, three. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for your many blessings and the blessed privilege that is ours to give our tithes and offerings. We thank you that as the owner of all things, you have given us this blessed privilege of stewardship over all that you've placed into our hands. We declare that we will be found as faithful stewards who will joyfully sow seed into the kingdom of God to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that as we sow into your kingdom, that you will cause all grace to abound toward us so that we will have sufficiency in all things and be successful in all that we set out to do. Because we have aligned ourselves with your righteous cause, we declare jobs, better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, bills decreased, and bills paid in full, overflow, blessings, and increase. I am a child of God. I am not bound by the world's economy, but I am an heir to heaven's economy. This day, I declare that I am walking in abundance and favor. Well, if you believe that today, put your hands together and give God a praise, even as we raise our gifts and sow them. Let's lift our gifts to God. Father God, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to sow seed into your kingdom. Now, God, I ask that you would look upon these who give today and bless them, and even those who have a desire to give but don't have, bless them as well. We'll be careful to honor you in the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ as we ask those blessings. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our doorkeepers are coming at this time. You know, the truth of the matter is, while we're giving, some of us need to be reminded that while we're in this waiting season, we still have to give. Anybody ever waited on something from God? Somebody's waiting on something from God right now. You've been praying about it right now. So as you give, remember that I'm sowing seed into what I need. Is that all right? But the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I need everybody to clap your hands. Come on, clap them right there. Let's do it together. Y'all ready? Let's go. See it.
Lord, somebody give him glory. If I wait on him, I'll have all that I need. Somebody's going to go through the week. Thinking, what am I waiting on for real? What have I been praying about? And some of us have been watching others get blessed, watching our loved ones, watching our co workers get the blessing that some of us think we deserve. But I want to encourage somebody today because the blessing you get might not come in the form that you think it's supposed to come in. But while you're praying for whatever the blessing is that's going to bless your household this week, God, however you want to do it, just bless me. God, I'm, I'm standing in need of a blessing. I, I don't even know what I need for myself, but you know. So God, let some drops now fall.
your prayer this week. Lord, let some drops, I need some of your drops to fall on even me. I know I don't deserve it. I know I didn't act like I was asking. But Father, let your drops of blessings, let your drops of peace, let your drops of joy, let your drops of love, let your drops of comfort, let your financial drops, let your mental drops. God, I need you to drop in my household. God, I need you to drop in the hospital. God, whatever you want to do, drop it on me. However you want to bless, put it on me. I'll take it wherever you want me to go. I'll go however you want me to get it. Even me. Bless God for the blessing. 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 I didn't say clap for the choir because the choir won't be there on Wednesday to help you get it. I said bless him for the blessing. Some of us got to learn to bless him on Monday for what's coming on Friday. Some of us got to learn to bless him on Sunday for what's coming in 2020. If you need a blessing from the Lord, bless his name right now. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and bless him. Lord, hear our hearts cry today that you would rain on us with your showers of blessings today, the light of your love. Lord, we don't even have to worry about what's happening with our neighbor because the word of God says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering because he's faithful, that promise. How many of us know that we serve a faithful God who will do exactly what he said he will do? So I'm not looking at your season, but the Bible says that in my season, I'll bring forth fruit. So in my season, I can go ahead and worship you and magnify you for what you're doing, even me. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we magnify you. Lord, we thank you for what's to come because what's coming is better than what's been. If you've got an even me praise in your spirit, I dare you to throw your hands up and give God a praise like you expect him to do what he promised that he will do. Even me, even me, even me. Our expectation is of him today. Our expectation is of him. I don't have to worry about what's behind me or what's to the left. My expectation is of him. And he that was, that is, and is to come is faithful to do what he said he will do. So I don't have to wait until I see it to bless him, but I'll bless him on a promise. I'll praise him on a promise. I'll praise him because he's faithful. I'll praise him because he's a deliverer. I'll praise him because he's a strong tower. What do you know of him? Let your experience inform your worship this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. got to get into the word of God today. We've got to get into the word of God. Why is it always me? I, you got 30 seconds, 30 quick seconds. Y'all not going to get me in trouble. Let's bless them real quick and we got to get in this word.
let's bless the Lord. Let's extend our hands and give him a wave offering this morning. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. He's worthy of praise and honor. And this is the perfect atmosphere for the word of God. And this is the perfect atmosphere to receive the word. The grounds of our heart are ready. So we are going to go right into the word of God. So if you will join me in scripture. Join me in scripture. And we're going to go to Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 9 through 13. And before we do that, we also want to thank God for the Gordon High School reunion. People who are worshiping with us, let's thank God for them this morning. We appreciate you. We celebrate you. On behalf of Dr. Craig L. Oliver Sr., we welcome you here and we thank you for your presence. Well, let's get into the word. Romans, the 8th chapter, we'll commence reading at the ninth verse. And it reads, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And for our time together, we'll talk from the subject, Lord, renovate me, the new you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence already showing up, Lord. We thank you. We honor you, Father. In this atmosphere, God, we ask that you would change hearts, change lives, Father, and bring someone to salvation today. We'll be careful to give you honor and glory in the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. And once again, we thank God for his presence. As you all know, concurrent with the renovation of our Atlanta campus, we have embarked upon a journey of spiritual renovation, wherein collectively, we have sought that God, by his grace, would renovate our lives for the better. Now, along this journey, we have recognized that if we're going to experience true renovation, we must acknowledge that the skill set required to renovate our souls exceeds our own ability. It exceeds our capacity. How many of us know here today that you don't have what it takes to renovate your soul? But what is required, what is needed, is the power of the Lord himself to come in and do a work of grace in your life. Again, we don't have the ability to renovate ourselves, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit working in us that allows us to navigate this terrain. Moreover, we recognize that if we're going to be renovated in our lives, it not only requires truth with ourselves, about ourselves, but we must ask God and seek him for an inward change. See, a surface change is when I make changes on the outside, where, where I dress it up just to look the part. But how many of you know you can look the part, and you can even act the part, but if your inside is unclean, if your inside is not consistent, you're merely doing just that. You're looking the part, and you're acting the part. It is the grace of God that allows us to experience true renovation from the inside out. Scripture declares that a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things, good things. Additionally, we must have minds that are postured and receptive for renovation, recognizing that it's imperative that we get rid of negative mindsets that hold on to sin and, dis and dysfunction and embrace the mindset that is renewed and nourished by the word of God. And so we've been very intentional about dealing with some biblical points and principles as it relates to the process of spiritual renovation and in light of that today, we're going to share from the writings of Paul as he writes to the church at Rome and how God has a new you or even a new me in mind. In the book of Romans chapter 8, we will find at least five elements of transformation that Paul articulates as being true in the life of every believer. This is the new you or the new image that God has in mind as a result of the finished work of Christ Jesus in our lives. So let's look at the first, the first, the first element of transformation. Right off the bat, the first element of transformation is found in Romans, the eighth chapter and the ninth verse, and it reads, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So the first element of transformation would be our new position, our new position. Paul is asserting that the new position that believers have as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ is not a fleshly one, but rather it is a spiritual position. 
But in order for us to fully understand that, let's look at the profile of individuals who are still stuck in the old position or still dominated by their flesh. This profile is given in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses five through eight. And it reads, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So when we look at these, these verses, they give us a profile of individuals who are still in their old position. And it is stated that they live, they live according to the flesh. What does that mean, Maxwell? What does it mean when we say they live according to the flesh? Their lives are lived in a manner where their flesh is nourished and sustained by what they take in. Scripture declares that those of us who live by and set our minds on the things of the flesh will indeed die, but those of us who live by and set our minds on the things of the spirit will live. So when we feed our flesh, I'm not talking about our physical body, but I'm speaking to our carnal nature, the old man, the unregenerated man. And so things that would fuel or feed that would be things such as lust, uh, negativity, negative thoughts, doubtful thoughts, fear, all of those things. Those feed our fleshly man, our carnal man, so that it is strong. But here's the challenge with that. On a journey of purpose, you don't need a strong carnal man. You need a strong spiritual man. And our spirit man is fed by and nourished by the word of God. The word declares, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So then if I'm feeding my spirit man, I'm either feeding my spirit man or I'm feeding my fleshly man. And, and, and it's kind of that juxtaposition that we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about healthy food versus junk food. Healthy food will, of course, fuel your body for the physical demands that you're going to make on it because it has the nutrients to get you where you need to be. You certainly wouldn't decide that you're going to take a five-mile hike and for your fuel, snack, stock up on some snack cakes and Twinkies and, and, and Snickers. That, that wouldn't be something that would properly fuel you. You might feel excited in the beginning, but I promise you by mile two, we're going to be picking you up off the floor because your body is not fueled for the journey. It, it's the same way. Your, your, your body requires healthy food such as whole grains that have the requisite ingredients to get you from point A to B to fuel your body for that particular journey. It's the same way with trying to lead a life of purpose fueled and fed upon with doubt, lust, worry, fear, anxiety. Think about it this way. You're going on in purpose and you know that there's some things that God told you to do, but if all you feasted upon is negativity, if all you feasted upon is doubt, when you get to a certain juncture, when you get to a certain point there, when you go to draw on strength to move forward, what are you drawing upon? You're going to draw upon that doubt that tells you you can't do what God purposed you to do. You're going to draw upon that fear that makes you feel intimidated about doing what God told you to do. Oh, but the person who has learned to feed their spirit man with the word of God. The word of God said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is why this is important, because there are some journeys of purpose that absolutely require faith. So then when I get to a juncture in life where I come up against opposition, instead of being full of fear and worry, I, I, I come up and I'm like, no, no, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because that's what the word of God says. When, when there would be a situation that might intimidate me, the word of God springs up in me because I've been feeding on it. And it says, listen, God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but he's given us power, love, and a sound mind. And so then I then approach my situation in my life journey fueled for it and able to stand. I don't come to it intimidated. I come to it now expecting to be victorious. I come to it now expecting to be uh, victorious because of what I fed myself. So ask yourself, what are you feasting on today? Is it health food or is it junk food? That's the difference between living according to the flesh versus living according to the spirit. But, but Paul says, so listen, those who are in the flesh, they live by the flesh. But those who are in the spirit live and mind the things of the spirit. And so then he shifts in verse 9 where he presents our new position with this pivotal word, however, Romans 8 and 9, it says, you, however, are not in the flesh, 
but in the spirit. No longer dominated and controlled by the flesh, we have been repositioned to a new realm that is the polar opposite to the flesh because we're now in the spirit. What, what, what does that mean, Maxwell? Uh, the reality is anybody that is, is born, anybody that is born, you're born into the fallen race. As a human being, we, we inherit that carnal nature. That's just our, that's just our, our, our right of birth as people, as humans in the earth. We are born to the fallen race. What do you mean by that? We have that carnal nature innately. You don't have to teach a little baby, a little kid how to lie. They do it quite naturally. Come on, think, think about it. The little two-year-old with the, crust, the crumbs all over their face, and you're like, did you eat that cookie? They will look you dead in your face and say, no, looking just as sweet and cute as they want to be, lying through their teeth. Because that is the nature that we've inherited. It's only by the new birth that we're transferred from the flesh realm to the spirit realm. It, it is by accepting Christ that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness and, and to the kingdom of his dear son. So what does that mean? As a result of our faith in Christ, we have been transferred from a place where we are dominated by the impulses of our flesh and now transferred to a place where we enjoy freedom by his grace. Romans 6 and 6 says, our old man is crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. What this means is we have literally, literally been released from the dominion and the power of sin. What does that mean? That means I now, you now, when we're in Christ, we have the power to say no. We no longer have to live according to what our flesh dictates to us. Now, prior to Christ, if, you, if your struggle was anger, when your flesh told you to pop off, guess what? You popped off. If, you're, if, you're, if your flesh told you to just go in, tell somebody, you, you, that was just, that's what you did. You know, there are some people, listen, I throw people out. That's what I do. You come up in my house acting crazy, I toss you out. That's what we do. Because you were living according to your flesh. However, when we've accepted Christ, now we are released from that pop-off spirit. We, we no longer have to, we now have the choice to say, no, I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to put that under subjection. I'm going to operate after the spirit. Now, we don't always make that choice. Any witnesses in the building? But you have the power to do it. You do have the power to do it. We have been transferred from bondage to freedom. We have been transferred from darkness to light. We have been transferred from being mastered under the law to being covered by his grace. We have been transferred from being guilty, guilty outside of relationship with the Father to being declared righteous in accordance with his great grace. Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I now have an immutable relationship with the Father that the enemy can't do anything about as a result of the finished work of Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's good news. That's good news. That's good news. There is nothing that the enemy can do to pluck me from the hands of God. Nothing that he can do. That's good news. I know some people get excited about houses and cars. I get excited about the fact that I am permanently in relationship with the Father. Permanently. It's from that space that we can say Romans 8 and 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We can now cry out, Daddy. We now have relationship. So not only did we receive a new position. In addition to a new position, we've received a new possession. Let's look at Romans 8 and 9 again. It says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So Paul presents a second fundamental truth regarding who we are as believers. Besides having a new position, we now have a new possession. We have the spirit of Christ the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of us. That means we aren't just in the spirit realm, but now the spirit resides in us. And this is a matter of faith and fact for every believer. At salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit to abide, reside, occupy, and live within you. And here's the thing. He doesn't just live to be a, a passive guest, but rather he wants to control your life if you allow him to do so. He wants to take full control because, listen, you have 
everything that is contained within the context of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God, his power, all of those things within you as a result of the Holy Spirit making his dwelling place with you. So if renovation is going to occur within the life of the believer, it will happen as a result of the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit within the believer. We said it earlier, you don't have enough discipline or willpower to renovate yourself. If you did, you'd already change. I, I'm a believer that most people, most people really do want to do the right things. They do. Most people really do want to change, but they don't have the willpower or the strength to change on their own. We require the Holy Spirit to do within us and for us something that we could never do for ourselves. But here's the beauty of it. He resides on the inside of us to do just that. He resides in us to do just that. But we're clearly dependent upon him. John 15 and 4 says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in me in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. We can't process any type of renovation. We can't make any type of changes without the work of the Holy Spirit. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers is presented in Romans 8. It's, it's, he's there to minister to us. Let's look at some of the things that he does. The first thing that he does is outlined in Romans 8 and 2. He won. He sets us free. The word of God says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We are no longer slaves to sin. Secondly, he comes, the Holy Spirit, he dwells within us to renew and refocus our minds. Romans 8 and 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. He comes to lead us. Romans 8 and 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Now listen, God will lead us. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. He will lead us away from sin toward God. But here's, here's the stipulation. You've got to follow. You've got to follow. Now, let me give you an example. Have you ever been sitting in your home and, and the telephone rings and you look and you see the caller ID and you, you look at your phone and you're like, oh, and, and the Holy Spirit and on the inside, don't, don't take that call. Don't take that call. Where the disobedient people at who click accept anyway? Where you, <laughs> you accept it. And then disaster, a drama, or something that you didn't want to happen follows. And you say, man, if I'd have just followed my first mind, no. It, it's really, if you had listened to the Holy Spirit, he was trying to lead you, but you didn't follow. Another case in point, have you ever been in an intense conversation, argument, have you ever been in an intense conversation with someone? And they say that one thing that you have the most epic clap back for, you're like, oh, I'm about to get you. Oh, you, you, you start smiling while they're talking. You're like, uh -huh. I, oh, I got you. I wanted you to go there. And the Holy Spirit says, don't you do it. And you're like, ah, oh. and you can't resist it. So you just go ahead and slam them. And the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Then the wrath ensues and you ask yourself, how did I get here? Again, if, if we follow him, he's leading us, but we have the responsibility to follow we have a responsibility to follow. The fourth thing that he does is he assures us. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's not in there just for kicks. He's in there because he has a ministry. He assures us. Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In other words, it's not based upon me feeling like I'm wonderful and feeling like I'm a child of God because there's sometimes when you don't feel like you're a child of God. But it's the Holy Spirit on the inside confirming and affirming that you are connected. And then the fifth thing that he does, he helps us. He's the helper. Romans 8 and 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Let, let's drill into that a little bit. When life becomes too much, when it becomes too burdensome, when it becomes... Too, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us interceding for us. 
That's, that's an amazing thing. Listen, I, it, it's wonderful to call your prayer partner because, listen, I, I want my prayer partner to pray with me. And it's wonderful to call your brothers and, and, and your circle of friends to pray for you. But there is something about knowing that the Holy Spirit itself is interceding and, and, and beseeching on your behalf. Because here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is able to do what no other can do. See, the Holy Spirit is able to translate when you don't even have the language because you're hurting so bad. You don't have the language or the words to say what you need to say. It's inexpressible, but you, all you know to do is cry out and to cry. But it's something about the gift of the Holy Spirit that is able to translate those tears, translate those, those thoughts, and communicate them to the Father in a way that's in alignment with his perfect will. I don't know about you. It's, it's one thing to have deacon so-and-so and brother so-and-so and and sister so-and-so praying for me, but I'm excited about the Holy Spirit interceding for me. He intercedes for us. He is our regenerator. He is our renovator. But but let's move forward. He is not only, we are, in, in Christ, we not only have a new position, we not only have a new possession, but we have a new power. A new power. Romans 8 and 10 says, but if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let's zoom in on that phrase. Christ is in you. That is the power. That is the resource. That is what we have to lead this life. The Christ in us, the anointed one, Christ on the inside of us, living inside of us. That's the resource. That's the power that we have access to to live this life. Christ said, I come that you may have life and life more abundantly. This is the interesting part here. Isn't it amazing that we can have Christ living on the inside of us, yet relegate ourselves to lead lives of defeat, depression, dissatisfaction, and despair? We just said that Christ, the anointed one, is on the inside of us, but we're leading lives of despair, defeat, depression, and dissatisfaction. And, and this is a challenge not only for those of us within the faith, but for those of us without, outside of the faith. Think of it this way. A, a friend of mine was addressing a group of theology students back when I was in college many years ago. And he spoke to the lack of demonstration of faith and power and even joy that often fueled the fire of disbelief in those who were outside the faith. In short, he was saying, listen, they, they're not necessarily disputing what's in the Bible. They're disputing what our lives look like. Because we don't seem to display what we say we believe. He, he literally said, and I, I quoted him, he says, there would not be as great of a struggle for conversion if our lives demonstrated that our message was truth. People cannot be convinced of what our lives fail to demonstrate. You say it works, yet your life demonstrates that it fails to work in you. Most people don't operate in theory, so they insist that we provide the evidence. Let our lives be the evidence they need. And, 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 here's, and here's why that's an easy fix. We just talked about it. Christ is in us. Christ is in the anointed one on the inside of us. Now, Scripture emphatically declares in Colossians 1 and 27 that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. If there's anybody that should be walking around with hope, it is the people of God. That is not to say that things are always perfect because, listen, life happens for the believer just like it happens for everybody else. So we experience good days and bad days. But listen, I am never without hope. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. It doesn't matter how crazy things look. I have a hope on the inside that says, I trust God, and it doesn't matter how crazy it looks. I have the hope of glory on the inside of me, and so I can't walk around defeated. I can't walk around distraught because I have an expectation that is fueled by the one that lives on the inside of me. Scripture says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If we walked around like the greater one was on the inside, of us what if we approached every situation like the greater one lived on the inside of us when we came to circumstances we wouldn't come timid see I don't have to come timid to circumstances even when I look like I'm outnumbered because the greater one is on the inside of me God and I are the majority even when it looks like I'm outnumbered I still have more than what you have because I have the greater one on the inside of me and then the Bible goes on to declare that now thanks be unto God who always calls 
causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. So I don't even have to wait for triumph. I can just, based on his word, based on the good credit that he has, I can give him a praise even before I see the victory and magnify him for what's to come. That is why I don't have to wait till the battle is over. I can shout in the middle of the battle. I can magnify him in the middle of my circumstances. I can give him glory right where I am because he's faithful and he's just. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Now in this moment I will bless you. I don't see it yet Lord but I still got a praise on the inside. I don't know how it's going to work out but I'm still going to bless you because I know that you're faithful. Somebody praise him. That is the power. That is the power that we have on the inside of us. Christ Jesus, the hope of glory. So in this new life, we have not only received a new position, not only a new possession, not only a new power. I love this one, a new prospect. Let's look at number four, our new prospect. See, it's wonderful to be kept in this life, but what about what's to come? See, the word prospect refers to our outlook for the future. What can we expect? We've already seen that if we live our lives in alignment and according to the flesh, that we will die. But what happens in the future for those of us who choose to live by the Spirit? Romans 8 and 11 tells us. It says, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Let's look at that word track right there. It says, essentially, Paul takes us all the way to the future. He says, listen, I got you. The redemptive work of Christ Jesus has covered you not only in this life, but in what's to come. Listen, when this mortal body begins to decay, when, when, when it's all over, I not only have you in this life, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead will also resurrect your mortal body. It will always quicken. It will also quicken your mortal body. And in, 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 in essence, it says, because you have a new possession, which is the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed victory even on the other side. Ephesians 4, 1 and 14 says that the Holy Spirit is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance. It's like when you purchase a home, many of us put down what we call earnest money, which is a deposit of sorts that holds that property for us until we go to closing. It shows everyone that you're serious about redeeming or purchasing that property. The Holy Spirit is the earnest or the down payment for us. It's the proof that God will do everything that he said, even on the other side. So it's one thing to have that assurance on this side. That's great. But guess what? Even beyond this life, he still has us. This is why we rejoice. We can rejoice. That, that's why we don't have to fear what man can do to the body. Because the reality of the matter is, no matter what you do to me, guess what? Even if this mortal body decays, I have a promise that the Holy Spirit, that the power, the Spirit of Christ will quicken, quicken, bring alive my mortal body on the other side. That's a good thing. That's our future. So we're not only covered on this side, but we're covered even in the future. I got to close, but let's, let's look at the final thing. We have a new position in Christ a new possession in Christ, a new power in Christ, a future prospect in Christ, and then, listen, our new pursuit. I love Paul's writing in the book of Romans because it's, it's so masterful. I love that he took us all the way to the future and then, against the backdrop of taking us and showing us all that we have, all that we've received, the power we have, the future we have, he brings us all the way back to the present and, in effect, says to us, now, having known all of this, Having received all of this, this is how you should live. In light of all that God has positioned you for, it should inform the way you live in your present. Romans 8 and 12 says, so then, brothers, on the basis of that, on the premise of the aforementioned, on the, the premise of everything that we just talked about, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul says, in light of all of this, live your life from a renovated place. Live your life like you know you're redeemed from the curse of the law. Live your life like you know that your old man is crucified with Christ. Live your life as one who has been redeemed. And, and, and listen, it, it's, it's kind of like my mother used to tell us when we were younger. And, and to this day, it's still, 
it makes me laugh a little bit, but you, you'll be able to relate. We would get, my brothers and I would get ready to leave the house, and my mother said, now listen, don't be out there acting crazy. Act like you know who you are. Act like you got common sense. Act like you know where you come from. Act like you know who you are. And don't be out there ruining our good family name. <laughs> our good family name. And, and, and in effect, she was saying, act like you know who you are. The, the, the same thing Paul is saying, listen, you've received a new position, a new possession, a new power. Uh, you have a future prospect. Now govern yourself accordingly. Live in accordance with the spirit. Live your life no longer controlled by the flesh and impul impulses of your flesh. Why? Live righteously, not because you're trying to become righteous, but because you already are. Because you already are. The word of God says he had made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're not trying to get righteous, those of us who are in Christ. We are righteous. Paul is saying now from that space of righteousness, live your life like you know who you are. Live, like you're, live your life like you know you're redeemed. Live your life like you know you are called. Live your life like you know you are a son or daughter of God. So what does it mean? God has a desire that you and I lead a life, even as I close, that is pleasing to him. And the only way to lead that life is from the vantage point of understanding our new position in him. Yes, we are no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. Understanding our new possession, that the spirit of God lives in us. Understanding our new power, that we've been empowered by the spirit of Christ on the inside of us. Our new prospect that even when life ends, we have the blessed hope that the same power that raised Christ from the dead will resurrect us. So then we have this new pursuit, that we live in accordance with the Spirit of God, fully informed with who we are in Him. I pray that you've been blessed by this word today. I pray, I pray that you are encouraged to live out this life in righteousness because it's who you are. And so, Father God, we thank you for what our ears have heard. We thank you, Father, for this time together. Lord, we even thank God for the person who does not know Christ and the pardon of their sins. God, we ask that they would be challenged and convicted today, Father, that they would see the necessity of you in their lives, Father. Father, we thank you, Father, for all of these things, Father. Even as we extend this invitation, we bless you, we honor you, Father. We trust you with the results, Father. We trust you to give the increase. We'll be careful to give you all of the glory and all of the honor. In the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake, amen. If you will stand with me at this time, we're going to extend an invitation to those who don't know Christ and the pardon of their sins. And not only so, but those who desire church membership. EBC isn't a perfect church, but... We serve a perfect God, and we thank God for the leadership of Dr. Craig L. Oliver Sr. and Lady Cleo Oliver, who are leadership, they are leadership worth following. And so we, we offer Christ to you today, and if that speaks to you today, you can meet me here at the altar, even as our music ministry comes. for our sister who came here today. Come on, Elizabeth, let's thank God for her today. We recognize that it took a lot of courage for you to come from where you are.
But we are firmly believing that this is a pivotal moment in your life where God is going to do something amazing. And so we are excited to have you join us on behalf of Dr. Craig L. Oliver Sr., our senior pastor, and Lady Cleo Oliver, and even the EBC family. We would like to welcome you here. We thank God for you. Our workers are going to take you. They're going to minister to you in a more detailed way and pray with you. But we just want to thank God for you one more time. Let's thank God for our sister as she follows our worker. How many of us are excited about the new us? It's a daily process, ain't it? All right. Make sure you remember the new you when you go out of the parking lot today, Jesus. Make sure you remember that. Right before we say the benediction, I want to remind everyone of two things. Uh, the EBC, Cru EBC Crusaders are presenting the 2019 EBC Softball Fun Day. We want to encourage you to join them that Saturday, September 14th at 9 a.m. at the Atlanta Southside Sports Complex. Uh, you can text the word at EBC, at, um, excuse me, at play EBC to the number 81010 to register to play, to coach, or volunteer. And listen, we're looking for co-ed teams, so please, please sign up. And then lastly, the Single Adults Living in Truth, our SALT Ministry, singles, singles, where you at? Well, all righty then. They have the SALT Conference, which the theme, Intentionally Winning in Your Season, at EBC Atlanta, Tuesday, September 24th, and Wednesday, September 25th. The guest speaker will be none other than Pastor John Ramsey Sr. of the New Life Worship Center in India, Indianapolis, Indiana. Please come out, join us. We would love to have you there, and we thank God for you. Let's look to the Lord for our dismissal. Father, we thank you for what our ears have heard today, Father. We thank you that, Father, this word will stand up strong in us throughout the week, God. Now, Lord, may your grace, your joy, your love, your peace rest, rule, and abide with us all henceforth, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.